Amen. Good morning and welcome. Let's all stand together, if you would, please. And we're going to start off today singing the banner of the cross. There. start the service off. Thank you for being here on this Lord's Day. We're so excited to be able to worship the Lord together. I want to ask Brother Andrew Beltran if you'll be making your way to the platform. This morning our focus for our featured missionaries is Bill and Kathy Kepler who are serving the Lord in Honduras. And so uh, let's remember to pray for them. Honduras has uh, always been a difficult place to serve. Uh, but especially in these last few years. And so let's remember to pray for the Keplers today and also for the people of Honduras, that many of them would come to know Christ as their Savior. And uh, so glad to have Brother Andrew Beltran. Now, for those of you who don't know Brother Beltran, Brother Beltran is blind, and uh, but he doesn't let that keep him from doing many things that others might would allow them to keep him from doing. And I'm so thankful for him today. He's going to come lead us in prayer. And then our choir is going to sing about our great and mighty God. And uh, you say, you know, when you think about God and whatever your problems are in life, I want you to know God is greater. And the choir is going to sing about that today. So, Brother Andrew, you come and lead us. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you, Lord. We love you. Uh, we're grateful as Christians, Lord, that we can, uh, we have you that, that come to us every day and, and, help us through our days lord but we're also thankful that we can start the beginning of the week where we come to you lord and we meet together and we can fellowship with each other and, and get ministered to through uh, the holy spirit through our pastor uh, lord i pray that anybody who might be hearing this through live stream or uh here lord that if they're having issues if they're lost and and they don't realize what the answer is lord i pray that they could put aside the the cares of life and the distractions lord and and just listen to uh, what the the message and singing and the message from the pastor lord that they might realize that there is not not only a, an answer to their earthly problems to, but an answer to the eternal uh, issues that they might have of everlasting life that you can provide lord i pray that you would also be with bill and kathy kepler in honduras lord as uh, they most likely are meeting at the same time, Lord, and uh, as we are right now, Lord, that we would be uh, understand that it's an extension of the ministry that we have here, Lord, that you would help them and, and guide them through their, their ministry and, and uh, their services today as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Bring your 
Glad we serve a great God. Amen. All right, let's stand together if you would please. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Something we can count on every day. There will never be. Remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Since they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. on us. His blood was the payment, his 
life was the cost. We stood beneath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Amen. Wasn't that a blessing? Wow. Amen. We know our sins are many, but aren't you glad His, His mercy is more? It was wonderful. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to remind you of a few things. We're glad to have uh, Brother David Bariso here with us. He's a missionary to the Philippines and he'll be sharing with us a little bit about the work that God has called him to do in this evening service. Uh, don't forget, uh, next Sunday there's going to be a multi-generational choir workshop that's going to take place from 4.30 to 7.15 here in the sanctuary. So the rest of us will meet in Lippert Fellowship Hall for our regularly scheduled evening service. We'll start at 6 p.m. as always, but we'll be in the Fellowship Hall uh, because they'll be having an important practice time. And then there's a couple announcements in regards to the teenagers, moms and dads. If you have teenagers in your household, get them involved in the youth ministry and have them come to the teen activities. That's a good opportunity for them to get to meet other teens and kind of get assimilated into the group. And so they're going to have a Sunday night after church activity next Sunday night. That's going to be hosted by Brother Jesse and Miss Rachel in their home. Transportation will be provided to their residents and back. And so they'll leave just after the workshop is over after the evening service is over and then they'll have your uh, teenagers back here at the church at nine o'clock but they do need to sign up in the lobby for that teen activity so they know how much food to prepare and then uh, that's just a Sunday night activity but then on February 19th they have a full-blown teen activity going to main event for laser tag bowling pizza that one's a little more costly um, but that's just what we have to pay to get in there so the cost is $17 a person they'll meet at the church at six o'clock and return by 9.30. Again, Jesse and Rachel will be sponsoring that and you'll need to sign up for that in the lobby. And then there's another ladies activity quickly coming up Friday night, February 26th from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. The ladies will enjoy fellowship together at Painting with a Twist. Has the address located in the bulletin and then uh, the cost for that is $20 per person and, uh, and also you'll need to sign up in the lobby for that. Our multi-generational choir will be performing in about four weeks on Sunday morning, February 28th. And so they've been practicing for a couple of weeks with the addition of the uh, children's choir and the teen choir. And they have been joining them and starting practicing at 5.15 on Sunday afternoon for the last 30 minutes. And we got a little bit of a late start last week. If you can please have your children, teenagers here by five o'clock, just have them sitting in the sanctuary and then Miss Sherry will call them up at the appropriate time there, okay? And then let's see, um, this week is Super Saturday Soul Winning. And so everyone is encouraged to come and to be a part of that. And we'll meet in Lippert Fellowship Hall at 930. We'll have a light breakfast, a devotional challenge. And then we'll go out and visit new move-ins to our area. We have gift bags prepared for them. We'll welcome them to our community and invite them to come and visit our services. And so if you can come and be a part of that, we could use your help. We'll try to hit 120 homes or more. And so the better workforce we have, the more we can get accomplished. And then if you've not yet received your uh, uh, book of offering envelopes for the new year. They're located in the lobby 
and they're on a table. They don't have names on them, so just grab one and go, and uh, that'll help you throughout the course of the year. All right, well, let's stand together once again. Let's have all of the children ages 4 to 11. You can be dismissed to the back, those that have not done so yet. But the Randy Posey is going to be leading junior church this morning, so you'll have a good time in there. So we're going to sing at the cross, and then Rachel's going to come and sing peace in the midst of the storm. And the waves continue tossing me from the storm I call his name for relief from things distressing me now so quietly again, though he does so much for me, his sweetest gift will always be peace in the midst of the storm. Though I know 
some storms will come my way. Let my enemy be sure. I will not be lost at sea. There will never come a time that with prayer I cannot find. Peace in the midst of the storm. song through experience. Would you say amen? amen? Sometimes in life, God speaks peace to the storm, and sometimes he speaks peace to my soul. Sometimes he calms the storm, and sometimes he calms me. Amen. But he is the Lord of peace, and I appreciate that good message and song. Take your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts and chapter 1. While you're turning there, our academy students are having a fundraiser luncheon today, immediately following this service. But even if you didn't sign up and plan to come for the luncheon, they are having a bake sale, and they'll have some items located in the lobby there. Uh, Now, let me just remind you, this is a fundraiser. This is not, let's make a deal, all right? And uh, the point is to pay in excess of what the product is worth. Amen. It's, it's, you're paying to express your love, not to barter. Okay. So that'll be in the lobby afterwards. The book of Acts. Last Sunday, we began a brand new Sunday morning series. I will be preaching through the book of Acts probably throughout the course of the year. And we're talking about the book of, book of Acts, the power of God. And last Sunday morning, we looked at verses 1 through 11, and we talked about living between the beginning and the ending. We left off with verse 11, which is the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll recall the disciples were standing there staring into the sky as they watched Jesus ascend and disappear. And then the two angels asked him, why are you standing around? Get busy doing what he told you to do. The same Jesus that you saw leave will so come in like manner. He's coming again visibly, physically. And when he comes again, every eye will see him, the Bible tells us. And so we're going to pick up our study now uh, with verse 12. And I want to read for us verse 12 through 26. So let's all stand for the public reading of God's word. They have watched the ascension. And after the ascension, verse 12 says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, men and brethren, 
This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he had burst asunder in the midst, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that that field is called in their proper tongue Asodama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. I want to talk to you this morning simply on this subject what can we learn from the first church? We read here about the, the, uh, the young church, the embryo church that Jesus Christ started on planet earth. What can we learn from the first church? We who are 2,000 years removed, living in the 21st century, here January 31st, 2021, what can we as Grace Baptist Church learn from the first church. That's what we want to talk about today. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day and thank you, Lord, for just the sweet service you've given us already. We're so grateful to have uh, faithful church members here today, but also a number of guests that you've sent our way, how we're honored that they would come and worship together with us today. I pray especially that you would bless them today and, uh, and, and be a, a sweet help to them in their lives. Lord, I pray as we look to the word of God that thy Holy Spirit would open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things. Lord, we pray that you would teach us, give us understanding, Lord, uh, that we might live according to knowledge. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you can be seated. Whenever Lionel Richie, the famous singer of the Commodores, penned the lyrics to his hit song, Easy, and he wrote as the main line of that chorus, Easy like Sunday morning. When he penned those words, it became apparent that he obviously had never had to get a family of children ready for church on Sunday morning. Now, in all fairness, it's usually your mothers who handle the circus of Sunday morning in the home. You know better than anyone the weekly challenge of getting everyone woke up, cleaned up, dressed up, and up to the church on time without anybody killing someone in the family. It can be quite a task for sure. Can I tell you, while I think it is important to give attention to our attire for worship, I also think it's important to give attention to our attitude for worship. I want you to think about something for a moment. What is it that we are really getting ready for when we get ready for church? When we as a body of believers assembled together in this place, what is it that we are expecting to happen? In the opening chapter of this book of Acts, we find this first congregation of believers gathered together in an upstairs room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem. Just before Jesus had ascended back to heaven, he had told them that they were to go there and that they were to wait for the fulfillment of the promise, that blessed day, when Jesus Christ would send the Holy Spirit of God to come upon them. And so what we find in a sense in this text is the church getting ready for church. In other words, what we find in a sense is they were preparing themselves for that day 
when they would break out into the world with the power that Jesus had given unto them in the person of the Holy Spirit, that they might begin to do the work that Jesus had commanded them to do in this world. Now for us today, the Holy Spirit has already come. In fact, if you're a child of God by faith in Christ alone, if you've been born again, when you got saved, uh, you were born again into the family of God and you received a birthday gift from God. And that was the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He is here with us today because he indwells all of us who are saved at this very moment. And yet, I think there are some things that the Lord Jesus wants to teach us from this account of his church getting ready to be the church in the world. What can this first congregation of believers teach you and I who make up the congregation of Grace Baptist Church today? Well, let's begin by considering together, first of all, what we can learn from the people in this congregation. As we look at this text and as we think about the people that are spoken of here, there's something I believe that we as a church, as well as every church, can learn from the people in this congregation. Now, in your mind, I just want you to imagine for a few moments opening the door to that upper room in downtown Jerusalem. It's crowded, to say the least, with over a hundred people packed inside this place. And as you look around the room, you see there are former fishermen there. There's a former tax collector there. There's a revolutionary fella there. And there's lots of just common everyday people, both men and women. And yet, although this room is filled with a lot of common people, as well as a lot of people who maybe have had a shady past, the thing I want you to remember is this, there is unbelievable potential gathered together in this place. You see, this congregation of 120 souls is the early church. The embryo church that Christ is going to use on the day of Pentecost and he's going to usher in the next stage of his work in the world. Now, I understand that in many ways, the first century gathering is drastically different from our congregation this morning. But I remind you that the same risen Christ is Lord over us all. And the same spiritual power in the person of the Holy Spirit is in us all, giving to every single person in here, listen to me, great spiritual potential to be used by God in the work that he is doing in the world today. I don't care who you are. Listen to me carefully. I want you to know God can and he wants to do great things in and through your life. And collectively... God wants to do great things in and through this congregation of believers. And so that being true, what can we learn from these people? There's much that we could learn, but I want to point out at least two things for your thought and consideration today. For one thing, we learn from looking at this first century church that no one is insignificant. Now, I don't know who needs to hear that today, But God wants someone to hear that today. No one here in this church or any church in the eyes and estimation of God is insignificant. We learned that by looking at this congregation. No one that names the name of Christ, no one that's been born again and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ is insignificant when it comes to what God can use you to do in his work in this world. In obedience to Jesus, this group has returned to Jerusalem. They're waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Luke lists some of the people that were there. But he doesn't name them all. In fact, he only lists the names of a small percentage of them. 
He names the original 12 disciples minus Judas Iscariot. Look again at verse 13. It says, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. Now let's be honest. When we read about this assembly of the early church, we expect that cast of characters to be there. Those were the hand-picked, Jesus-called disciples, the apostles, the ones that were witnesses to his resurrection. I mean, you kind of expect, listen, I don't know who you came expecting to be at church today, but I dare say you expected me as the pastor to be here, right? And so when we read this list, we expect these people to be at church. Their lives have been intertwined with the life and ministry of Jesus for the past three and a half years. Yeah, sure, they're going to be there. But there were others there as well. In verse 14, Luke mentions the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren, Jesus' earthly half-brothers, they were there. But even beyond that, verse 15 says the total head count was somewhere around 120 people. But of that 120 people, only what, 12, 11 disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus, those are the only ones whose names we were given. And so that causes you, if you're a thinking person, to stop and ask the question, who are all these other people? And the answer, we don't know. Maybe the famous family from Bethany was there, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Perhaps Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, those men who cared for the body and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps they were gathered in that upper room. We are not told who they all were, but the, anonym, the anonymity of much of that congregation doesn't mean that they were insignificant. Just because we don't know who they were doesn't mean that they didn't matter. Because though we don't know their names, God did. And every one of them were equally his people. And he sent the Holy Spirit to all of them. Peter didn't get more of the Holy Spirit than anybody else got that day. John and James, they didn't get more of the Holy Spirit than any one of the unnamed people that are gathered in that upper room. And so while they're anonymous to us, that doesn't mean at all that they weren't important, that they were insignificant, that they didn't matter. On the day of Pentecost, we know that Peter was going to be used by God to be the primary preacher. But listen, you need to understand that all of these people were a part of what Jesus did through the Spirit-empowered church on that great day of Pentecost. They all had a role, they all played a part, and they were all important to the cause of Christ. Now, you realize that in every local church, this one's no different, in every local church, there are going to be those people who are more visible, those people who are more vocal, but everyone in the church is valuable and vital to the Lord in the work that he wants to do in the world. Every member matters. Every member has a place and a part in the body. Back in the church where I was saved, I got saved when I was 13. So when I say grow, grew up there, I don't mean as a child, I really grew up in my teen years, but in the church where I was saved and grew up, we used to every year have a church pictorial directory printed. 
And you know, you, you, you've seen those, you're familiar with them. It contained a picture of all of the families that were members and they would appear in this book in alphabetical order and it would have everybody in the family's name and it would have their birth date minus the year because that's how women folk are and it would have their anniversary date and, and, and it would have their address and their phone number so that you could connect with people in the church. And in the back of those directories, there was a page with a list of people whose photos had not appeared in the directory. For whatever reason, those people didn't make it out to the church on picture day. And every year without fail, one of the names on that list was a dear Christian lady by the name of Rita Graham. She was an elderly lady. She's still living today. She's really elderly today. But she was an elderly lady. And it wasn't that she didn't show up on picture day. For whatever reason, she didn't like having her picture taken. Nobody argued with her. And so her picture never appeared amid all the families and faces of the congregation. But anyone who knew Rita Graham knew that even though she might not be pictured in the directory, she was a pillar in the church. As we look at this original congregation, both the names we know and the names we don't know are important. And I wanna to say to every member of Grace Baptist Church, you may not have a role in this church where you're visible and vocal. You may not teach a Sunday school class. You may not provide pulpit supply. You may not even be in a sea of faces up here in the choir. You may not sit at a piano and play the, uh, and accompany the, the music. Listen to me, you may not be someone who the spotlight shines on very often, but you are not insignificant. You are equally important to the work of God. And what God wants to use you to do in and through this church to further the cause of Christ in this world is just as important as what anybody else does for the Lord. Amen. And so we learn from the, the people in this first congregation, we learn that no one is insignificant. Everyone's important. Every member matters. What else do we learn? Well, we learn secondly, that no one is irreplaceable. Now, some folks may be here today that are shy and timid and you may struggle with self-esteem and, and you need to hear it said that no one is insignificant. But some among us perhaps think too highly of ourselves. Some of us may think we're God's gift to the church. And you need to hear no one is irreplaceable. When Luke listed the names of the original disciples, there was one name that was left out because he was no longer on planet Earth. That name was Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason he's not listed is because he was dead and presumably already in hell, right? Luke with the forensic details of a doctor, which he was, describes the gruesome way in which he died. It's, look at verse 18. It says, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And, you know, he could have just told us that he died. But he says, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. I mean, that's the details of a doctor, right? I mean, it's like an autopsy. What happens? You remember Judas, he, he started feeling guilty for his betrayal of Christ. Remember, he tried to go to the religious leaders and return his money and said, we don't want your blood money. And he threw it down and ran out. And what did he do? He went out and he hung himself. He hanged himself. I, I don't know. The Bible says he, he, he fell and burst asunder. I don't know what happened. Maybe, maybe he hung himself and maybe he sat there in the sun and, and baked and boiled and, and bloated up and eventually the rope broke or the limb broke and he fell and burst asunder. His guts spilled out everywhere. Or maybe they took that old dead body that had been sitting in the sun and they took it down to the field where he was going to be buried and they threw that body on the rocks and when it landed, poof, burst asunder. I, I don't know. As disgusting as that image is, 
It serves as a reminder of how despicable and detestable Judas's sin had been. As Peter said in verse 17, Judas had, past tense, Judas had been numbered with the 12 disciples. It says he had obtained part of the ministry. But he had also been a guide to those who came and took our Lord to be crucified. Judas Iscariot had betrayed the Son of God and in so doing, he had forfeited his part in the church and in the cause of Christ. And as we will see, I don't want you to miss this. Part of why Luke records this scene for us is to show us how the church went forth about finding someone to take Judas's place as an apostle. And someone among, don't miss this, someone among that 120 could and would step up and fill the spot that was vacated by Judas Iscariot. You see, the loss of Judas was tragic to the church, but it was not terminal to the church. The church would go on without him. You know, there's a lesson to be learned in that. You see, from time to time in the life of every congregation, important people go away. Sometimes, like Judas, it's because of their sin. Other times, it's not a falling away. It could be simply a moving away. They move somewhere else where God will use them. But either way, because no one in the church is insignificant, no one in the church is irreplaceable. You see, as long as people in the church are willing to obey Christ and submit to his lordship and surrender to his will, there will always be someone in the shadows to step up when someone else steps aside. There's only one indis indispensable part of the church and that is its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he lives, the church will live also. What can we learn from the people in this congregation? First of all, we learn that no one is insignificant. And if you struggle with self-esteem, if you struggle with whether or not you have a place in this church, whether or not you're important and whether or not there's a role for you to fulfill, I want you to know you're not insignificant, you're important. And the church will only reach its potential as all of us step up and do what God wants us to do in the church. No one is insignificant, and because no one is insignificant, no one is irreplaceable. If someone moves on, if someone falls away, if someone moves away, if someone steps aside, there are those in the ranks who can step up and the work can go on. What we can learn from the people in this church or congregation. Number two, I want to talk to you about what we can learn from the priorities in this church. The instructions that Jesus had given uh, was to go back to Jerusalem and to wait. And when the church members went back to Jerusalem, while they were waiting, as they had been told, they didn't just sit around looking up at the ceiling. They went back and they waited for the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit, but they weren't just twiddling their thumbs. And what they did points us to some things that not only were important to them, but things that still ought to be important to you and I as the church in this day. So notice some things that were a priority to the early church. Number one, prayer was a priority. Look at verse 14. It says, these all continued with one accord in what? In prayer. These people were in agreement together. And the thing that they agreed about was the need for the church to pray. You know, within the church from time to time, there'll be issues or matters where there's room for disagreement. But one thing that surely the church ought to always be able to agree upon is our need to pray. God's house would be called a house of prayer. 
Jesus had promised to send them the Holy Spirit, but they still prayed in anticipation of his arrival. You see, it was the promises of Jesus that prompted them to pray. And can I tell you, the word of God is filled with promises that have been given unto us. And God's promises to us ought to prompt us to pray. Now, numerically speaking, reality is that the midweek prayer meeting is usually the smallest assembly the church has during the course of the week. That's numerically speaking. But spiritually speaking, the midweek prayer meeting has always been the most important gathering of the church in any day. And we can learn from this first congregation, their prayer service preceded their preaching service. They were going to have a, a, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter was going to stand and he was going to preach boldly. And he was going to declare the name of Jesus and declare him to be the Savior of the world. But we see here that a prayer service preceded their preaching service. They knelt in prayer together before they stood in power together on the day of Pentecost. Listen to me, church family. Listen to me. I want to encourage you to make it a holy habit in your life. I want to encourage you and challenge you to prayerfully consider making it a priority in your life to attend the church's midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. Prayer meeting may not be the most exciting thing that the church does, but it's the most essential thing that the church does. And I want to encourage you. And I know you say, well, pastor, I can pray for the church without being here on Wednesday night. I understand individual prayer is important, but God has promised and attached certain blessings to corporate prayer. God wants his people to come together and agree with one another in prayer. We're talking about things that we can learn from this early church. We see, first of all, prayer was a priority. We also see that prophecy was a priority. Now, I use the word prophecy here, not referring to the future, but referring to the scriptures. You'll recall from reading our text this morning, when Peter stood up to address the vacancy that was left by Judas Iscariot, he started with the Old Testament scriptures. Look again at verse 16, where Peter said this, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas. Now, when I read that, it reveals something to me. Apparently, while they were in that upper room, they had not just been sitting around staring at the ceiling and twiddling their thumbs, and they had not only been praying, but they had been studying their Bibles. And believing them to be not just the words of men, but the very words of God, they searched the scriptures for guidance. And that's always a good thing to do. Listen to me, folks. In every church, searching and studying the scriptures must be a priority. What God says to us in his word is more important than what anyone else might have to say. I want you to notice what Peter didn't do. Peter didn't stand up before the congregation and say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, please give me your attention. Look right up here and pay careful attention to what I'm about to say. Me and the other disciples have been talking about it and we have come to the opinion, we think that we should find someone to take Judas's place. No, that's not what he did. He spoke to the men and to, to the women and he said, the spirit spoke through David. In Psalm 69 and in Psalm 109, he said that someone should take Judas's place and that his office should be given to another. So, brothers and sisters, let's do what the scriptures say. Amen? Listen, in any congregation, what the Spirit of God says to us in the scriptures, that should be what motivates us to do whatever it is that we do. Not by what's popular in our day, not by cultural trends, not by ministerial gurus who are hosting the latest church growth conference. We should pray and we should search the scriptures and we should say, hey, let's make sure we do 
what God says we're supposed to do. So what can we learn from the priorities in this congregation, in this church? Prayer was a priority. Prophecy was a priority, meaning that they searched the scriptures and then they patterned their church and they did in their church what they found the Bible said they were to do. And then we see that proclamation was a priority. Notice why Peter led this congregation to follow the scriptures. Look down at the close of verse 22. The reason they needed someone to take Judas's place was so that he could be, in Peter's word, at the end of verse 22, a witness with us of the resurrection. You see, this congregation, they weren't concerned with church politics. They were concerned with Christian proclamation. They were most concerned with the witness they were going to have in the world around them. Look right up here. I want you to listen carefully because this is something that we as a church need to avoid. I'm afraid too often churches become too internally focused. What I mean by that is this. We become overly interested only in programs and ministries that benefit the members inside the church. And we forget about the masses outside the church. We forget about, we we just kind of want to have a holy huddle in here away from the world. But listen, this church was getting ready to be the church. And we come to church and we gather in this place and we worship him and we look to the scriptures because we as a church are getting ready to be the church out in the world. To go out and to be a witness for Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, we can sort of become a spiritual gated community. Where everyone is safe and comfortable inside while the world is perishing and going to hell outside. The only gates the church should ever think about are the gates of hell. And how we're going to storm them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and rescue lost souls. Listen now, the priorities we see in this original congregation, they transcend that upper room. And they translate into this room here today. And their priorities should be our priorities as well. Prayer a searching and studying of the scriptures that we might follow them and the being of a witness for Jesus Christ out in the world. Well, what can we learn from this church, from this congregation? First of all, we see what we can learn from the people in this congregation. No one is insignificant and no one is irreplaceable. We see what we can learn from the priorities of this congregation, prayer, prophecy, and proclamation. There's a third and final thing I want us to see from our text this morning, and that is this. What can we learn from the procedure of this congregation? Now, somewhere along the way, many local churches have adopted some of what are known as Robert's Rules of Order. I don't know Robert, but I hate him. (laughs) God forgive me. I hate Robert and his rules. But somewhere along the way, it's probably a deacon decided that the church need to be governed by Robert's rules of order. And so we started saying things like, I make a motion and I second it. And is there any discussion? This is all things that come from Robert, not from Romans. The procedure we find followed in this opening chapter of Acts is certainly not any kind of what we would call parliamentary procedure. They conducted their business meetings differently than we might do them today. And yet there is a basic aspect of their procedure here that I believe ought to impact how we do things as well. Let me show you what I mean. For one thing, notice with me their decision. Now follow what happened here in this story. Brother Peter stood up 
And he stated to the congregation very clearly what the situation was. Using the scriptures, he motivated them to take action. Judas had left a vacancy that needed to be filled. Peter described the kind of man they were looking for. Look at verse uh, 21 and 22. Wherefore of, wherefore of these men, there in the congregation, in the 120, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness of his resurrection with us. And so you know what he did? He set forth to the congregation what were the qualifications that should be considered when they were choosing a man to fill this position. Now look at verse 23. It says, and they, not Peter, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So they gave the situation, gave the qualifications, and the congregation agreed, hey, either one of these two guys, they are eligible they are qualified. Either one of these could fill that position. There are two things that you see going on here. Listen, there is leadership and there is partnership. Are you listening? This is the procedure for how things should be done in the Lord's church. There is leadership and there is partnership. Peter led in this direction and the people partnered with him. When it says they appointed, it refers to the whole congregation. They chose from within themselves two men who could do what Peter had described. Now, in the church still today, in whatever we do, there must be leadership and there must be partnership. Are you listening? As the pastor, I have a God-given, God-assigned responsibility to lead you as I follow Christ and to lead you according to the Word of God. That being said, I alone cannot make all of the decisions for what we are going to do. In all of our ministries and missions, you have a voice. You want to know why? because no one is insignificant and because we all have the same Holy Spirit and we all have the same scriptures. So you have a part to play in seeing that we accomplish what Jesus is leading us as a church to do. Now I say that for this reason. If you are not actively a part of what God is doing in this church, then in a way, you're against it. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So as you see the body of believers in Acts chapter 1 making a spiritual decision together, it ought to motivate each and every one of you who are a member of Grace Baptist Church to make sure you do your part and that you are a part of what we're doing together in this place for the cause of Christ. Their decision. But then notice their dependence. Don't get the idea like, okay, I heard what preacher said. I'm going to start throwing my weight around here. Now, some of you would hurt some people if you did that. So don't start doing that, all right? I want you to notice not only their decision, but notice their dependence. Because after two men were chosen from within the group as being fitting candidates to take Judas's place, look at what the people did in verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Don't miss this. The, the people acknowledged that while they had a voice in the matter, that the choice really was not theirs. They had a voice, 
but it wasn't their choice. They were to voice the Lord's choice. The choice of who would replace Judas belonged to the same Lord who had first called Judas. Jesus is the one who should decide what the church does. Oh, how important it is that we always remember in all things, listen to me, the choice is not the pastors, the choice is not the deacons, the choice is not even the peoples, the choice is the Lord's. And what we do is we use our voices to affirm what we believe God has led that he wants to do. The church is his church. And ultimately he must lead where it will go. Now, that brings about a practical question. How would they know which one Jesus would choose? Well, verse 26 says they cast lots. They would write the two names on two small rocks, one name on one rock, one name on the other rock. They would place it in a a vessel, a cup, and they would shake it up Yahtzee style. This is the casting of lots, all right? And that's how they would determine the leadership and the direction of the Lord. Now, to us today, that seems rather random, really even up to chance. But that was not the case to this group of Jewish Christians. Remember we talked about last year, uh, last week, that Acts is a book of continuation. It's a book of action. But the first thing we said it is, it's a book of transition. And we find in the book of Acts that, that God is transitioning his church to do things in a different way and to work in a different way. But at this particular time, this was not unusual for these Jewish believers. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And so where the lot falls is under the control of the Lord. Now, to them back then, this casting of the lots was to them not random or chance, but rather total dependence upon the Lord. Um, Because they didn't, when you were a kid, did you ever have one of those magic eight balls? And you'd ask it a question and you'd shake it up and then it'd float around and that fluid inside of it and it would come up and, and if you didn't like the answer, what would you do? Shake it up again, right? Well, they wouldn't do this. They would cast the lots and they believed that it was completely under the control of the Lord. This was the way that God worked in that time. It was a method that they used to reveal God's sovereign choice. Now, we no longer cast lots in this day. In fact, what you read in Acts chapter one is the last time that we read of God's people determining something by the casting of lots. Why? They're in transition. You see, right now they're casting lots because they don't yet have the Holy Spirit. And so we determine God's sovereign will as his spirit within us leads us and especially as he leads us through the scriptures. And we have to trust him to work out his will among us as we prayerfully follow him, as we yield to him, as all of us check our egos at the door and it's not about my agenda or what I want to do. It's not my choice. I am a part of the whole church and I use my voice to affirm God's choice as I pray, as I seek his will through his spirit's leading and through the scripture. And that is how God has transitioned to leading his church today. Leadership, partnership, submission, and infilling of the Holy Spirit coupled with what the Word of God says. Because listen, the Holy Spirit will never ever lead us contrary to what the clear teachings of the Word of God are. Now, the Bible doesn't spell out every decision we have to make in the life of the church in the Scriptures. So we come together in prayer We surrender our will to the Lord and ask for his guidance. And there is partnership coupled with leadership. These are some important lessons that we learn from this early church.
Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I want you to know that is the immediate and most important decision you will ever make. I want you to know Jesus Christ, the son of God loves you. He was born into this world of a virgin. He lived a sinless and perfect life. He went to the cross and there he died for your sin. He paid the price that you owe as a sinner. And in so doing, he made a way whereby you could be saved from your sin and receive his eternal life. But God gives you a choice. You can choose to reject Jesus Christ and say, no, I'm going to try to get to heaven by being good. And you can choose to do that if you want. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you die without Jesus Christ as your savior, you will be eternally separated in a place called the lake of fire, never with another opportunity to be saved. Or you can simply and humbly confess to God that you know you're a sinner, that you need his forgiveness, and that you understand he paid the sin debt for you at Calvary, and you're putting your trust in him and him alone to forgive you of your sins and save your soul. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there's never been a day in your life, a specific day in a definite place where you realized you were lost and without Christ and called upon him and asked him to be your savior, the Bible speaks of that as being born again. I was born physically July 30th, 1968. I was born again spiritually October 18, 1981. It happens. There's the miracle of a moment when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and he saves you forever. Has that taken place in your life? If not, then right there in your own seat, in the quietness of your own heart, just call on Jesus right now and ask him to save you. And the promise of scripture is that he will. And then to those of you who already know Christ as your Savior, and specifically those of you who have been led of the Lord to become members of Grace Baptist Church, may we today learn the lessons from our text. You are not, you, you are not insignificant. You are important. You're not irreplaceable. You need to be a humble servant of God. Make prayer a priority. The searching and the following of Scripture is a priority and the proclamation of the gospel a priority. Partner with leadership to carry out the will of God in his work today. Father, thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would help us to take it and apply it to our lives for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you need to make a decision today to get saved, to be baptized, to join the church, to rededicate your life to the Lord, you do what God would have you to do today. of thy love at the impulse of thy love take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee take my silver and my gold not a might would I withhold not a might would I withhold. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As you're seated, let's ask the ushers if they'll come forward and prepare to receive the offering this morning. Brother Brad Watts is going to come and he's going to pray for the offering today. Father, Lord, we come to you today, Father, just thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this day and opportunity to come to your church, to worship you, honor you, glorify you in word and in truth. Father, I uh, just pray for this offering. Pray that you'd bless it, bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
to say any beautiful. Well, let's all stand together this time. If we can have the doorkeepers head to their post. And uh, did we get the slides fixed for the benediction song? Okay. And so uh, God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let's sing it as a prayer unto the Lord in regards to his word that we've just heard this morning. Let the church say amen, let the church say amen, God has spoken, let the church say amen, let the church say amen, let the church say amen. God has spoken, let the church say amen. Have a great day. God bless you.